Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corru corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if these things be in you, for if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make sure your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will, always, I will not be neg negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye might, may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not fo followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as into a, a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for bringing us together this morning. And please bless uh, Brother Chad as he preaches your word. And open our hearts and ears to um, the word of God. And help us to learn something good. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just hold your place there in Second Peter, if you will. It's good to see you. Uh, I'm excited this morning to share what's in my heart and on my mind. So before we begin, I'm going to go ahead and pray too. I just want to ask God's blessing and help this morning as I teach and preach. So let's pray one more time together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the Bible and for giving us your words. I just pray that you would... Uh, Help me to teach clearly, and I pray that you will illumine the hearts of your people and that we would leave here with a better understanding of what you've done in giving us the Bible. We do love you, and once again we ask for your power and your understanding. In Christ's name, amen. So you're there in Second Peter. Hold your place like I said. Right away, we need to visit a few men in the Bible. So I'm going to do a very uh, quick um, look in the Old Testament and New Testament of four men in the Bible. So I know everyone here knows their Bible well. So if you'll just be ready to turn with me to several key passages. So get your thumbs, your fingers ready. Have your Bible ready to go. Because I want you to visit that story. I want you to read along with me some very brief passages so that we can all be reminded of the details, of the facts, of what went on in that man's life. So right away, go with me to Exodus 2, if you will. Exodus chapter 2. And if you know the book of Exodus, you know already this story, the story of Moses, right? So Exodus chapter 2 is where you want to head. The first man I want us to think about, I want us to see in the Bible is this man Moses, okay? And I'm going somewhere with this. We're going to tie it together. So let's look at the stories first of these men, okay? Exodus 2, the man Moses. Here's what the Bible says. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi and the woman conceived and bare a son and when she saw him that he was a goodly child she hid him three months 
And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. How about that, ladies, to be paid to take care of your own baby boy? Okay. God's good, isn't he? Okay, verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, became Pharaoh's daughter's son. Okay? And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Verse 11, I'll read half of it. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. So what we have here in Exodus 2 is the beginning of the life of the man Moses, the man who wrote the first five books of the Bible. Right here we see that Moses was born to Amram and Jochebed. Moses grew up underneath his mom's care and tutelage, and then he went to live with Pharaoh's daughter. Most likely in the palace, he was raised and educated underneath all that Egypt probably had to offer. That's Moses. That's his story. Turn with me to another book of the Bible, if you will, okay? David. 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you will. Jump over to 1 Samuel 16. I know you're headed there, so I'll go ahead and begin reading as you get there. 1 Samuel, Samuel 16. I've got to go quickly this morning. So, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill my horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which was the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me, before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Aminadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this, etc., etc. He goes through each of the sons of Jesse, right? Verse 11, let's pick up there. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And so we have the beginning of the story of another man of God. His name, David. Later on, we will call him King David. One of the greatest leaders of Israel, one of the greatest leaders really of all history and of mankind. The Lord filled him with his spirit and used this man in a mighty, mighty way. So that's King David. So we looked at the beginning of Moses. We looked at the beginning of David. You're still with me, right? Turn to the New Testament now, okay? Go to John 1. Pastor's been preaching through the book of John. It's been a help. It's been a blessing. Lots of doctrine in John. It's a great place for a new believer to begin reading the Bible because they will learn much right away. They'll learn about the word believe. They will learn about who Christ is. John 1, 
is where you should be. And I'm going to jump over to uh, the latter part of the, the first chapter of John, verse 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, speaking of Jesus, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and he abode with them that day, for it is about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, his brother. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now, we gotta, we got to jump ahead here, too, about Peter, because it's important to know something else about him. So go with me to Matthew 17. You're doing great. Just stick with me, okay? Coming to the end of the narratives. Matthew 17, okay? So you are in the fourth gospel. Go back to the first one. I'm speaking of chronological order, not necessarily in order of importance. <laughs> They're all the gospel, right? All right, Matthew 17. Let me pick up in verse 5. I'll back up. I'll start at the beginning of the chapter. The Bible says, And after six days Jesus take, taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when, his high, the, when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid, and Jesus came and touched them, and they said, and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And here Peter, or Simon Peter, is with Christ, James and John, and sees Christ, who is God, transfigured. So now we know a little bit about this man Peter, don't we? We need to look at one more man. His name is Saul of Tarsus, or as we know him, Paul, right? So turn with me, if you will. Uh, again, in the New Testament, let's jump over to Acts 7, okay? You're not far away, you're in the Gospels, just go over to Acts 7. Appreciate y'all thumbing all these pages with me. It, it's what I want you to see, it's important. So in Acts 7, I'm going to pick up in verse 54, I believe it is. Yes, the Bible says this. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. This is Stephen, who had just preached to the wicked religious Jewish leaders, and their heart is cut. Okay, that's the context. So here we are. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their coats at, the young man, at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Read verse 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. But we can't stop there. Turn a few pages later to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, again we see this same Saul of Tarsus, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. But then what happened? Let's read on. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. 
it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. We know not long after that Saul is converted to Christ. He meets Annas. And so Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul, the apostle. So here's my point. We've looked at four, what we would consider, no doubt, great men of the Bible, right? Moses, King David, Peter, and now Paul. I have a question for you. All very different men. <laughs> Some big differences, if we were to analyze it, right? Yeah. What do they all have in common? They're all writers of Scripture. Now, there are many other writers of Scripture but I picked these four this morning because we know them well and they're all significant. If you think about the difference in their story in the context, Moses being raised in Pharaoh's court only as Hebrew says later on to reject that teaching even though he had that culture and had that training and had those leadership abilities no doubt ingrained in him through what he taught, was taught and learned from one of the greatest kingdoms in the history of mankind as far as man is concerned. But then later on, what happens? In Hebrews, we know he rejected that and chose rather to suffer with God's people. He chose rather to love the Lord than what all of Egypt had to offer him. Hey, what about King David? A shepherd boy? A little guy like these guys. Out in the field? The least of his brethren. The youngest, right? He just keeps sheep, right? But God says, I've, I've chosen him out of the sheep coat, right? Yep. I'm looking on the heart. God made him into a mighty man. Peter, a fisherman. Just a fisherman. And his brother has to go and get him and say, hey, listen, we found the Messiah. Come and see. Come, Simon. Peter, one of the boldest preachers that ever walked. Bold man because of what God did in him. Then the Apostle Paul. Think of his training. Think of his background, how God used him. All these men very different, but yet God used all of them to write scriptures. And so I wanted us to dwell on that. Let me review what we covered last time. We looked at some key passages, four or five key passages in the Bible that teach us about God's bulletproof book. Because see, the Bible is not like any other book. The Bible is unique. It's God's book. It's perfect. And it's what God gave us. It's how we know truth. And so that's why I've chosen that title, God's Bulletproof Book. And last time we looked at key passages in the Bible where the Bible itself tells us, it tells anyone who's willing to read it, this is what I am. This is God's testimony. Prove me. I've written it down. It's my book. So we looked at passages like 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter one which Luke just read, chapter 1, particularly verses 16 through 21. We looked at Psalm 12, 6 through 7, which is our memory passage right now as a church family. Key, key verses. I think of Psalm 118, 89, where it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. So a couple of the statements that we made last time about the Bible was that the internal evidence, the Bible claims for itself to be God's book, and God says, Here's my examples. Prove me. Test me. See if it's not my book. And here's some conclusions we made from that. The Bible is inspired by God, meaning God breathed. God gave the words. They're all His words. So if all the words are God's words, God's perfect. That means they are without error. They are perfect. And we learn that from Psalms, that they are pure words. And then the psalmist, King David, gave us that illustration of silver being made perfect in a furnace. Why? Because when they heat it up, right, the dross comes up, they remove the dross, and then you have the perfect silver. Yeah. So by application, I want to say this morning, which we covered last time briefly, the King James Version, the authorized versions that we have in our hand as English speakers, is a faithful and unparalleled translation of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek languages that God Himself chose to give His words to mankind. And we can trust it completely. Mm -hmm. God has also stated that we will never lose His words unless we, for, unless we forsake it. But it's not going to be because of His part. God has been faithful to give us His words. 
That's what the Bible says about itself. These passages teach us that the Bible claims that for itself. So with the time I have remaining this morning, I want to shift gears just a little bit and let's look at the penman in the process. So if, if these things are true, if we really have God's book, which we do, and it's perfect and it's everything we need, and God said He not only gave these words, He said He's going to preserve them. He said they're forever words, if I could say it that way. It makes me just curious, how did God do that? And by way of application, church family, I want you to know the more I soul in or the more I talk to folks about the gospel so that they can know that they have eternal life like I do. And I know many of you here are soul winners. And you'll find that people have a lot of good questions. And I'm not talking about necessarily the, um, the scoffer. I'm talking about the skeptic. I'm talking about the ignorant, and I'm not using that as a pejorative term. I'm saying someone who doesn't know, someone who's curious, someone who's never read the Bible, and you walk up Bible in hand, light in your eye, ready to share with them truth, and they see that Spirit in you. They see the Holy Spirit in you, and they realize this guy's got answers, and they start asking you questions. And you know what? In that process, they may ask you questions about the Bible. I had a young man, I was telling pastor about this uh, two weeks ago, and he's like, but wait, Chad, you just told me the Bible's God's book, but you said that this book was written by John. Hey, John's a man. He, he, just, he was a logical guy, and he just made that conclusion. He's like, so did a man write it, or did God write it? And I don't think he was being, you know, slick there. He was just, this was new to him. And so I was able to go to some of these passages and say, okay, well, let me tell you what the Bible says about itself. What the Bible says about how God gave it to us, how it was penned, how it was written down. And earlier, we just looked at four men, right, that we agreed God used all of them to pen a portion of Scripture. And I picked four men that wrote a considerable amount, meaning God chose them to write a great portion of the cover-to-cover -cover copy that we have today. I think of the Apostle Paul, who no doubt wrote the majority of the New Testament as far as volume is concerned. You think about Moses, wrote the first five books. He wrote Psalm 90. King David, think of the Psalms. What would life be like without the Psalms? I mean, when life gets tough, and some of the days that you have are the darkest. Where do you end up? The Psalms. And we get to peer into the heart of David, which we realize these are not just David's words. They're God's words to us. And don't they minister? They, they come and they lift you up and they pull you out. It's because they're God's words. God used King David to write them. Think about Peter, a man who denied the Lord three times. But what would the New Testament be like without first, the book of First and Second Peter warning us against heresy and false doctrine and reminding us to stick to the faith that we have, the faith that our forefathers had, the faith of countless Christians, like what Paul said, right? And I'll conclude there with him in Hebrews, of all those that went on before us, the great cloud, those witnesses, right, of which we follow in their footsteps. So the penman and the process, that's what I'm talking about. It's a really neat process. i got a question for you. Is God the author of the Bible? Or is man the author of the Bible? Yes. It's God. Amen, Pastor. Did he use men, sinful men, to pen his words? Yes. So I understand they aren't the originators, but did God use them? Absolutely. So don't misunderstand me. Let's do a parallel. Is Jesus God? Amen. Is Jesus man? Amen. Now, I can't wrap my mind around that fully, but does the Bible teach that doctrine? Absolutely. And the more we study Christ and the more we look at Him, the more we understand that He is both God and man. So, folks, these words are God's words. But it's a miracle. And it's God's choice that he used sinful man to pin his words for us. Question. Think about Genesis 1. Could God have just written all of his words in a complete book and given it to Adam? He could have. God is able. He's almighty. He does whatever he wishes. But he didn't chose that method. He didn't chose that process. He chose to use the men that he created and that he loved. And through that process, He gave us His Word, mankind His Word, as we needed it, right at the right time, and then He preserved it right at the right time, and so we come down through history, and now here we sit today in this building with a cover-to-cover -cover copy complete, and we have all that we need from God. Anybody who tells you otherwise is a liar. 
He got that from the enemy. He got that from the devil. We have God's words. And don't misunderstand me. There are men who creep in, like Jude talks about, and they'll take faithful copies of God's word and they'll pervert it and they'll present it as God's word. That's just a ploy of the devil as well. It doesn't mean that we don't have God's word. It just means wicked men have gotten in and tried to destroy it, tried to attack it. And that's a sermon, that's a topic for a whole nother day. But today we're talking about God's penman and his process. We looked at those four men, Moses, David, Peter, and Paul. We looked at what they have in common, how God used them to pen the scriptures. And we reviewed, did we not, that the Bible claims to be God's Word. So let's talk a little bit about that process. You know, it's, it's really intriguing to me. I think, of, um, I think of Moses first. So let's go back to Exodus, shall we? Okay, go back to Exodus. Now there are times when God did Himself write the Scriptures, right? On stone tablets, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And we know about that story, so if you'll go with me to Exodus 24... Let's, let's re remember that story where God Himself actually wrote down physically some of His words. Chapter 24 of Exodus says this, And He said unto Moses, God said to Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with Him. This is the Mount Sinai experience, right? God descends upon the mount in fire and smoke, okay? Very sober story. Verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. He's a faithful man, right? And all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words, plural, words, which the Lord hath said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar and he took the book of the covenant. There's our book, friends. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. So think about the transmission here. God himself gives Moses his words. Moses is a faithful man. He writes them down. Or actually, first of all, he repeats them orally to the people. Then Moses, as a faithful man, writes them down and rehearses them again to the people. Both times they agreeing that we will hearken unto the words of the Lord. It wasn't just the words of Moses. In fact, they were the Lord's words. And God used Moses. Let's read on, shall we? I need to pick up um, verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. You've agreed. This is your covenant with the Lord concerning these words that He gave you, Israel. Verse 9, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. It goes on to describe their experience. Verse 13, And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Go back to verse 12, and this is where I want to end this passage. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tablets of stone, and a law of and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So hopefully now can you see a little bit more of the process? So here's, here's what I'm saying. Sometimes God chose to write the words himself. And mankind was tasked to write them, rewrite them, make copies. And then as we see here in Exodus 24, Moses taught the people the words. 
So they're rehearsing them, review them. That's why week in and week out, we get up here. Why is it that in a Baptist congregation, the preaching is preeminent? Because we know the Word of God is preeminent. It's what we need. It's what we have to have. So all of other activities center around this practice of reading, writing, and preaching God's words. It's very important. Why are modern churches watered down, we say? 20-minute sermon? Give a few um, positive comments, pick a passage and jump off of it. We call it, we call it springboard, preach, springboard preaching. It does not do justice to the words of God. The older I get, the more I need to read it more. The more I need to memorize it more. And my, uh, on my way over to Pensacola, Karis was challenging me. She already had almost all of Psalm 12 memorized. I'm like, shame on dad, college grad. And the 12-year-old's whipping me. So we worked on it for about an hour in the truck. She did better than that. <laughs> Isn't it important, friends, as we see the day approaching, right, that we study it and read it and know it more and more? This process of the pen, uh, this process in the pen and God used. Now we're tasked to continue to copy it and to read it and to know it. So that's Moses, right? Let's look at King David. Go with me to Psalm 12. So Moses actually had the privilege of seeing God write some of his words himself. And then Moses also had the, had the task of writing out more of God's words that God told him audibly. And Moses wrote them down. King David. I mentioned this earlier, but if you go to Psalm 12, I was just re referencing that earlier with Karis and with Pastor having selected that for our church memory verse. It says in Psalm 12, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Isn't it interesting, I'll stop at verse 4, that God's people depend upon the words of God, not their own words, but the proud and the wicked ignore the words of God and boast their own words. They're opposite. Verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. King David wrote this psalm, and as he's writing it, so this is a psalm from his heart, right? He's, we would say he's the author of this poetry, of this psalm. But yet in it, he states that the, wo the words are the Lord's and that they are pure. And he also states that God will preserve them. And this is a passage that we get the doctrine of preservation. That God not only gave us his words, but he keeps them. Mankind can't lose the words of God. It's impossible because God's the keeper of them. Yes. I do want to say something about the process here, though, that's important. There are times when groups of men despise God and his word so much that after consecutive generations they may find themselves in great darkness because they no longer have a copy of God's words in their hand as a people group. Now they still have their conscience that God gave them and we know God is faithful so if they will follow the light and the truth that they have, God will give them more truth and more truth and isn't it true that many a missionary has given his life to taking the words of God back into a culture that has rejected their maker? But there are groups of men that have suffered greatly because they despise the Word of God. Look at our own nation. We're on that path as well. Oh, Chad, come on, this is America. We were founded as a Christian nation. This is America. The words of God are even inscribed in some of our monuments, fast, fastly being removed, I might add. Hey, Chad, we were founded underneath the principles of preaching and, and local church type of culture in this nation. But yet we sit here today and we've, took it in, we've taken it out of schools. Now we've got a government telling churches you need to close your doors. Why? We know it's under the guises of because we said so and we hate God. They hate God's words. But folks, we need to love them all the more, and we need to understand all the more God's process by which He gave them to us. Case in point, I'm not going to be the guy that fails to give God's words to the next generation. 
And if local churches will have that attitude based upon what we know about the process, how God chose these men, they wrote down His words, God is preserving those words. Now we have a cover cover to copy and thank God for His providential care as English speakers that we have an excellent translation in our own tongue of English. And there's many other languages that can boast the same thing because of God's goodness and His faithfulness. And so now it's our job to teach it, read it, teach it, love it, and transfer it to the next generation. King David indicated that God's preserving His words. So that promise is there. So built upon that promise, now we move forward and know that we can never lose this, lose this book. In fact, Christians have even been killed and died because they wouldn't give it up. And even as they died at the stake, I wonder how much was hid in their heart. I wonder, it, it rolled off their tongue even. Because they knew about this process that God had given His words, that they were eternal, and that no wicked man could ever shut up the words of God. So Moses, King David, turn with me to Psalm 119. Very briefly, let's look there. The penman and the process. Psalm 119, let's look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. That's where we get our doctrine of preservation again. Forever are God's words preserved. God's the one keeping them. And then the Bible here is saying that they're settled in heaven. If God took time to give us so many scriptures, to give us confidence that He not only gave His words, but that He's the one keeping them, does it not give us great enthusiasm and great encouragement that we know what God's words are and that we can read them and teach them and give them to the next generation? Here's another thought I want you to think about as well. Moses, in, in Exodus 24, God actually wrote some of those scriptures down. Ten Commandments and other portions of the law. There were other things that God audibly told to Moses, and he was the faithful copyist, and he wrote them down and then taught them to the people. And then you come to a man like David. David was raised in the field, right? He was probably spent a lot of time alone. We know that he was a skilled musician, right, as we read through his life and see how God used him in King Saul's life. We see how David, as far as the scriptures goes, was the writer or the penman that gave us most of the Psalms. I mentioned it earlier, right? Yeah. The poetry is the word I'm after. So when you read the Psalms, you get a sense of the emotion of the Christian life, of all the struggles in it, and how men have felt about that, and what they did to overcome those struggles, and how God ministered unto them, and how God will minister unto you as He did unto them. Poetry does that for us. So God chose to use David and all his training to give his poetry. And I'm going to fast forward now. Stick with me with this thought. Then we come to a man like Peter in the New Testament, right? He's just a fisherman. You know, he, his brother probably found him in the boat or mending nets or something. You know, basic. He was a blue-collar guy just making a way for his family, doing what probably his father did, no doubt, and even his grandfather, those before him. But what did Jesus say about him? We read it earlier. He said, you're going to be called Cephas, the stone. Peter, I get this sense. I'm going to make you a rock, and I'm going to use you, Peter. And one of the ways God used him was to pen Scripture, to write it down for all of us that came after him. And then if you carry on with the thought, you have the Apostle Paul, highly trained man. We could say God pulled him out of scholarship, right? All the vain philosophy of man. But God built upon all that foundation. So just like Moses' training in Egypt, just like David's training in the field and his love for poetry, just like Peter's training, if you could call it. Because remember, what did they say about the disciples? They said that they were ignorant and unlearned men, right? Yeah. But they could tell, they could see that they had been with who? With Christ, the master teacher. So that's the man, Peter. And then you come to Paul and all his training. And God used him to write the vast amount of the New Testament. So I hope the picture's starting to come together on this 
process and the penman. And we're only looking at four of the men God used, right? And how he gave us his words. Moses writing the law. David writing all the poetry. Peter writing the, we could say, maybe doctrine or instruction. Or we also know Peter was a great influencer of men. He had great zeal. He was a prolific speaker, we tend to think, because he was bold. He was a bold man. So when you read the epistles of 1 and 2 Peter, we call them the general epistles. Why? Because they were written to all the church, right? And Peter admonishes us and builds us up. And then the apostle Paul. What was Paul known for? Such great doctrine, right? Line upon line, Paul would, would argue and lecture and teach the truth. So we have all those epistles. We have the book of Hebrews. Aren't you glad that God didn't just write down one big book of thou shalts and thou shalt nots and hand it off to Adam? He didn't do it that way. No. He chose to use us, mankind, in His almighty power, in His love for us. He chose this process that we've just very briefly visited this morning to give us the bulletproof book. And folks, Men will question this. Because obviously, when God does a miracle like the Bible, it's spiritually discerned, right? It takes eyes of faith to see that God chose to give us the Bible this way. So an unsafe person is not going to understand that. But if they're humble and they're willing to listen to the Scriptures, if they're willing to listen to a, a saint, a, a uh, Christian that wants to show them what the Bible says, then guess what? The Holy Spirit's going to illumine them, is He not? And He's going to teach them. So my desire this morning was maybe, number one, to give you a thirst to continue to study out this process of how God gave us, as one author put it, our God-breathed book, the Bible. And then to go on from there, and when you come across those individuals that want to know more about why, you know, why should I listen to the Bible? Because do we not agree, brethren, that all of us have an authority? Now here today, I would imagine most, if not all of us, we would say, this is our authority. We make no bones about it. We're not hiding that. We would tell anyone, yes, this is my standard. This is my authority for truth. I gladly tell you that. But we know that men who are not saved have other authorities, whether it's their own mind or another author or another man. Really, there's only two, right? It's either God's mind or man's mind. And we know the enemy works through man's mind to disseminate lies. So they have to choose their authority. They have to stick with what they know or what they believe they can figure out. Or they have to change their mind, repent. That's the Bible word, repent, change their mind, and put their trust and confidence in the eternal words of God. Isn't it amazing how when someone's willing to hear the Bible, they often get saved? Because at that point, we know the Spirit of God using, as the Bible is often referred to, as the sword. These words are like a weapon, right? And they pierce the heart, and they teach that person, and those person's eyes are open. They understand, this is the way of salvation. I need to believe. That's the Bible. And I'm always amazed at how God used sinful men to give us such an amazing book. The older I get, the more I learn about this process of how God gave us the Bible. So my challenge to you today is this. Number one, I mentioned earlier, continue to study and notice scriptures when God reveals more about the details of the process. Like just this past week, it occurred to me for the first time that there was that portion of scripture that God himself, we could say with his own finger, wrote into st stone tablets, right? Moses really had nothing to do with that. God did it. He said, here, take it down there and teach the people this. But then there were things that God gave to Moses he told Moses, and Moses faithfully wrote it down and then taught the people. So if you're a man that doesn't have faith, you would say, that can't be somewhere along the way. Moses' memory failed him, and he did not write that down all accurately. There has to be an error. The Bible does not teach that. So that's when God entered and oversaw that process and so that everything Moses wrote, everything David wrote, everything that Samuel wrote, everything Paul, Peter, John, James, God saw to it that the words were His words and they're pure, like David says. And we haven't lost them. 
Man tries to add to them. He tries to take away from them. But it's done. It's settled in heaven like David said. So look with me to one more passage this morning and it will be my final challenge to you. Go with me to the passage Luke read in Peter. Second Peter, verse 16, chapter 1, verse 16. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If you got a space there in your Bible, you can write Matthew 17, 5. Peter's quoting from Matthew and also Mark 9, 7 and Luke 9, 35. If you remember when he, we read it earlier, they were up on the mount, okay? So Peter's harking back to that and he's reminding the New Testament, hey, the Father said, hear my son. Verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter's explaining to us, listen, I heard the Father's voice myself. I was there with Christ when he said, you know, Peter, like many of us, right, sticking his foot in his mouth, hey, let's build three tabernacles. And then the Father speaks and says, hey, hear him. I be quiet. Listen to my son. Peter was there along with James and John. But then he states here in his own epistle, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You have it written down. It's in your hand. More sure than what I heard with my own ears. He's saying, you have the written words of God in your hand. You can have more confidence in that. Verse 24, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Here's where I get it, folks. It's impossible for there to have been error or errors or mistakes. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God Himself moved upon them to write those words, but obviously we know He used their personalities, He used their training, He used their background, but they are the Lord's words. Folks, this is a doctrine we believe because the Bible teaches it. And we believe it by faith. And though I've probably done a poor job this morning of describing to you the penman and the process, perhaps I have ignited a fire that you will continue on throughout your days until you see the Lord Jesus of learning more and more about the amazing process by which He gave us these words. One more thought. You're there in 2 Peter. Look at chapter 3. Sometimes when I'm out soul winning, I'll have someone say, yeah, but what about the Old Testament and the New Testament? You know, they'll come up with Legitimate questions are sometimes it's confusing to them why God would need to write two covenants or two testaments, right? But I like to take them to this verse and show them how the Bible is a whole. If you go to chapter 3, that says this, Peter again, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, let your mind wander back to Moses and to David, Samuel, okay? All the minor prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, the, all of them. And, circular word, and there if you will, of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Old and new, there it is. It's all scripture. They're all God's words. It's a coherent whole. Folks, you've been great listeners this morning. I appreciate it. I just hope that maybe a little bit of... Um, zeal and these passages will help spur you on to have great confidence in the Bible because the enemy will come along and he, he wants us to doubt because we live in a day where you do realize there's over, there is an ex excess of a hundred English versions of the Bible alone and that's, that's kind of a wonky number but the bottom line is that men are always procuring copyrights for a new version of the English Bible. Why? Because they want to make money and that's wicked. And I'm letting you know, you, your King James Bible is excellent. You could trust it completely. It is God's words to you. We don't speak Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. We speak English and God has been faithful to us. Now let us just transfer it to the next generation. Let us teach them about the penman and the process of how we have our God-breathed book, the Bible.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this doctrine. Thank you for being good and faithful to us and making sure that we, as a people group, have your words. Help us to be diligent in transferring that to our own children, uh, to our own neighborhoods and coworkers, and then, Lord, even if we have an opportunity to another culture or language, to do that as well. Whatever talents you've given us, help us to be faithful to this doctrine. We do love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.